God is good. He's the whisper in the wind and the rain when I listen. Don't just sing the words. He's the whisper in the wind and the rain when I listen. Elijah saw all sorts of phenomena. But it wasn't until the still, small voice that he actually heard God. God is seldom a shouter. It's more often a whisper. I won't get started, but we've, got, we've had a ministry that's been a blessing. Just being part of this fellowship has been a blessing. I'll talk about that a little bit later um, because there's a point I want to make. I want to take you to the first book of Samuel, chapter 9. So often when we look at the news on TV, we see the end of a story. We don't really know the start of the story. We see that there's been some family dispute that's ended up in a murder, but we don't know what went on all before that that brought it to that place. A couple of weeks ago, Neil play, uh, preached on uh, David and Saul and, jo and, and Goliath. And that is a, a message that's on YouTube, uh, on Ian's channel there, that you can see again. It's worth seeing again. I've preached on that many times. Most preachers have. But that was an outstanding word on that particular story. And Neil had asked me the week before that I might minister today, and I thought, you're delighted you're going to take every note I've ever written. He didn't. Thank you, Lord. But I want to go to the start of the story, and it's not the start of the story of David. We know that story. But what about the start of the story of Saul? 1 Samuel chapter 9, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, and so on. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now, yeah, that's quite a rap. <laughs> I thought he was writing about me for a moment, did it? That went over well, didn't it? Now, the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you and arise and go and look, into the, look for the donkeys. So they went looking. And they didn't find them. Verse 6 And he said to him, well, verse 5, when they'd come to the land of Zaph, Saul, Saul said to his servant who was with him, come, let's return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become worried about me. And he said to him, look now, there is in this city a man of God. He's an honourable man. All that he says surely comes to pass. So let's go there. Perhaps he can show us what we should go, the way we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, but look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone. There is no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man of God to tell us our way. Now that's interesting in itself. Saul's about to meet his destiny in God and only that he's got a believing servant alongside of him does he actually get to see Samuel. How many times has it been the faith of others for you that's got you there? The faith of others for you. So often it's not our faith that makes us. It's the faith of others for us. And here's a servant who's got a pittance in his pocket. But he knows that you don't go to see the man of God without blessing the man of God with a gift. And as small as it is, he says to his, to his master, why don't you take what I've got? That will be a blessing for the man of God. And Saul realises that that's a good word. 
Verse 10, Then Saul said to his servant, Well said, come let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. As they went up the hill to the city, they met some young women going out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? The word prophet for that. Is the seer here? And they answered them and said, Yes, there he is, just ahead of you. Hurry now. Today he came to this city because there is a sacrifice of the people today on the high place. As soon as you come into the city, you will surely find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. So they go into the city. Verse 15. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear, there's a whisper in the wind and the rain when I listen. The Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before, saying, tomorrow about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines for I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. Did you realise the powerful calling that was on Saul? That's amazing. We only know Saul the disaster. But here is Saul who is a man who is fulfilling the prophetic word of God to the prophet. And the prophet's being told after the event, I'm sending him to you. He's actually on his way. Actually, that's him just there. So then Samuel saw Saul, verse 17. There he is, the man whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Saul, the man God spoke to Samuel about. You hearing me? Saul, the man that God spoke to Samuel about, saying, this is the man I have chosen. Verse 17, so when Samuel saw the Lord, verse 18, then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, please tell me where is the seer's house? Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer, go up before me to the high place where you shall eat with me today and tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for your donkeys, they've already been found. Forget about them. Halfway through verse 20. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on all your father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite? And there's a story there I won't go into today. Of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin, why then do you speak like this to me? See, there's a calling on Saul's life, but he doesn't understand it. He's bewildered by it. Been there? Been there? I've been there. And there's still a calling on my life, and I am still bewildered by it. We're moving to Sydney, yes. We're moving to Sydney because we have special needs at this particular time, as many of you know. We're moving to Sydney because our family is there. Our daughter will be about half an hour away, our son about half an hour away, my sister about half an hour away, and Merle and my sister just love each other. So the support is going to be there. What about the ministry that's on my heart, the calling that's on my life? I do not have a clue. But if God's aligned the rest, he's going to align the rest, isn't he? Bewildered, but we go. Now when... This meal happens, Saul turns up and he's ushered to the highest seat. And Samuel says to the cook, you know I told you to put aside the best portion, this is the one to serve it to. It's all been organised by God speaking to the prophet. Verse 25, when they come down from the high place to the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the top of the house. They rose early and it was about the dawning of the day that Samuel called to Saul on the top of the house, get up that I may send you on your way. And Saul arose and both of them went outside, he and Samuel. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And he went on, but you stand here a while that I may announce to you the word of God. Often when God comes to us in this way, it's very personal. It's not for the ears of others. And this was the case for Saul. It is for others to discover, but it's not for 
for others to hear at the time. Verse, chapter 10, verse 1, Then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord, the Lord has anointed, the Lord has anointed you, command over his inheritance? Oh, wow. The Lord has anointed you, commander over his inheritance. That's pretty heavy. And then he goes on and prophesies. Verse 9 of chapter 10. So it was when he turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart. My Bible tells me that he will take the stone, stony heart out of me and put into my heart a heart of flesh. And that's what happened to Saul. Saul was... Born again. I didn't say it, the book says it. Saul was born again. Excuse me, Chris, this guy's an absolute idiot. He's a disaster. No, he's not. He's a man with the heart of God. A man with a calling. A man with an anointing. God gave him another heart and all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came there to the, ho to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets that the people said to one another, What is this that has come upon the son of Kish? is Saul also among the prophets. Well, wow. Verse 14, Then Saul's uncle said to him and his servant, Where did you go? So he said, To look for the donkeys. When we saw that they were nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. And to Saul's uncle, the fact that they went to Samuel, pricks up his ear. And he says, Tell me, please, what did Samuel say? Oh, he told me the donkeys have been found. When the Spirit of God touches our lives, and it's clear it is the Spirit of God, if you don't own it and honour it and rightly declare it, you're already starting the wrong way. Now I could go on and read a lot more of this scripture because to an extent we know the end of the story. We know that Saul was an utter disaster, that he completely lost sight of God, that he lost sight of anything to do with God, that, that he, he, he died an awful death. And Morris was telling me on Thursday night he's the only, only um, Jewish leader in the Bible that's reported that he was Amazing. Wasn't even honoured with a grave. What happened to the young man who was led by God to an anointing, who received the anointing, who received the new birth, who received the Spirit of God, who exercised the gift in the Spirit of God? What happened to that young man? He didn't treasure the gift of God. He didn't treasure the anointing of God. He didn't press in to what God had put on his life. And the end of the story is an utter tragedy. But what we do find is that he truly had an encounter with the Holy Ghost. It was life-changing. It was calling-focused. It was the fulfilment of prophecy. And there was a powerful release of gifting. Even for us Pentecostals, there's a familiar pattern, isn't there? Anointing, laying on of hands, prophecy, sense of relief of, of gifting and activation of gifts. We hear it all the time. We're Pentecostals. We believe in it. We left our ministry of 30 years when somebody said to me, 
this, this laying on of hands stuff, this, this speaking in tongues stuff. Look, your career is more important than that. And I said, well, you might say that, but I don't. And it's been a journey. It's been a rough journey. But it's been a journey that I'm glad we walked. Because it's been a journey in God. I'd rather that kind of a journey than a journey that's not in God, wouldn't you? I want you to turn with me to the first letter of Timothy. 1 Timothy and chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And verse 12. When Paul wrote his pastoral letter to Timothy, he was writing to encourage clearly what one of what his, we would call one of his most significant sons in the faith. But if you read the story of Timothy, and if you read between the lines in this letter, and if you read this letter, you'll understand that Timothy was not easily ministering the gospel. It, it didn't sit easily on him that there was a calling on his life. And Paul talks about the fact that he knows his tears. I don't know about the other pastors in this room, but I know this. The day somebody said to me, Chris, I believe there's a calling on your life to become a minister, would you go forward to the altar and offer your life? And I said, well, um, 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 uh, well I'll go and see what I can do. And I remember going forward to the altar that day and it just so happened that my mother was the secretary to the man who was heading up recruiting the ministry. So when I went forward to the altar and somebody came to speak to me about the decision that I was making, I appealed to a higher authority. I said, please may I speak to the colonel. And so the colonel, who was my mother's boss, came to me and he said to me, oh Chris, how lovely to see you. And I said, Colonel, I need to tell you, Harold thought it was a good idea. I don't. And he said, well, we would just put it down as an inquiry, will we? I said, that's good. There's no thought in my mind that I was going to respond to the calling of God to be the, to be the minister. Oh, what a joke. I was working for the Reserve Bank of Australia. I'd started to climb the ladder. I was doing my banker's studies and my accountancy studies. I was in, the career path was underway. Get out of the road with a call. But one Sunday morning, some month, maybe a year later, I sat in a service, a children's Sunday school anniversary all those years ago. We're talking over 50 years ago, so it wasn't yesterday. And the minister who was ministering in the Sunday school anniversary said, I've got a message for the children here, but God's told me there's somebody in this meeting this morning who needs to respond to the call of God on your life. I'm going to speak to you. And when the invitation was given, I just fell at work. Timothy was a reluctant minister of the gospel. There's no two ways about that. But Paul says to him, let no one despise your youth but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, and do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Do not neglect the gift that was in you, that is in you, that was given to you by prophecy through the laying on of hands. I wonder this morning, and I want to be this blunt this morning, I wonder how many of us, if not all of us, have had the ministry call or the, the, the prophetic word to a specific line of ministry. And ministry is not about being a pastor, it's about fulfilling the gifting on your life. Who's had a calling on your life to fulfill the gifting, whether that's the gift of pastor or the gift of evangelist or the gift of hospitality or the gift of helps? There's a gifting on your life that came after prophecy and the laying on of hands and it's lying dormant. Like Paul, like, like Saul, you've, you've not been prepared to even tell your uncle about it. 
You've kept it such a secret. And yet you know it was real. There was a moment in time when God touched your life, he put gifting into your life, and you've... Oh. We had a church not far from here, and a young man used to come to me almost every Sunday morning and say to me, Pastor Chris, I have the gift of evangelist. When are you going to use me? I'm sorry, if he has the gift of evangelist, he presses into God, God activates the gift and he does his work in Christ. It's not up to the pastor. We love Pastor Neil and Pastor Nance and Joe and, and David and others. We love them. We love their ministry. We love the anointing that's on their life. We love it when they pray with us and all that sort of thing. But they are not responsible for the gifting that's on my life. I am responsible for the gift that's on my life. I am responsible for it. If it's dormant, it's because I'm dormant. Paul says to Timothy, do not neglect the gift that was in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands. We know that the, the word for gift is charisma, the gift of God's grace. We know that. Well, if it's a gift of God's grace, we ought to be honouring it, not putting it aside not sticking it on a shelf somewhere and saying maybe one day, someday, never. Have a look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the warfare. Timothy, you have had the hands laid on you, now I am giving you instruction. No, that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying to Timothy, you received the prophetic word and you know the prophetic word and you looking for the work that God's given you to do, fulfil it according to the prophetic word that was given to you. You start pressing into the gift. You start pressing into the gift. I commit to you the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage a good warfare, having a good conscience. You see, we, we, we'd love to think that it's up to Pastor Neil to sort us out, but I'm sorry, it's up to us to cooperate with God. I'm just going to say, he's too busy sorting Neil and me and Joe and all the others out. We don't have time to sort you out. We're trying to get ourselves sorted. You think that's funny? It's the truth. On several occasions in the book of Revelation, John is overwhelmed by the revelation he's receiving and when he's discussing it with an angel, he falls at the feet of the angel and starts to worship the angel and the angel says, for heaven's sake, get up. I'm just a servant like you. And there's a sense in which we as pastors have to say to our people at times, for heaven's sake, get up, we're just servants. I'm not responsible for the calling on your life. I'm, I am responsible for doing what I can to stir it up and I'm trying my hardest this morning, let me tell you, to stir it up. But the reality is you have to press into it. You have to press into it. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6 well, let's start at five. I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm... Oh, what a wonderful heritage. He's got it from his heritage. Excuse me, that's not what Paul's about to say. He's saying, I, 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 you've got a wonderful heritage, but Timothy, but Timothy, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hand. God has not given us a spirit of fear and Timothy was as fearful as they come and that's the context of this word. Timothy was as fearful as they come about the ministry that God had entrusted to him. But Paul says him, God's not given us a spirit of fear but in context of the anointing and the prophetic word and the empowering that's on your life, he's given us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Now press into that gift. Press into that gift. Press into that gift. I don't know what the gift of God on your life is, but I guarantee that if there's ever been a laying on of hands or an anointing on you, then a gift has been imparted. 
what that gift is, we as pastors, when we do that at times, haven't got a clue what's being imparted. It's up to you, but you know. You know. But then you don't lay around waiting one day, Pastor Neil will take notice of me and give me something to do. For heaven's sake, stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. Stir it up. Stir it up. The gift of God is in you. The anointing is on you. Stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. Well, we could go into what kind of gifts are given and all that. We don't have time for that. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, have a look at that. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Peter is saying, the things that I've written to you, I've written to you for a very specific reason. I want to stir up the stuff that you've already heard and that you've already received. I want you to press into that stuff. That's why I've written these letters, to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. In the message, Peterson says, I hold, uh, hold your minds in a state of undistracted attention. undistracted attention. He's the whisper in the wind and the rain when I listen. Time's just about gone. Let me just share an interesting story way back in Genesis chapter 26. The story is of, is of Isaac. And Isaac had gone to Gerar, which was in the area con controlled by the Philistines, and the king was Abimelech. And he said to Abimelech, uh, I need somewhere to live. Can you let me have some land? I've got flocks and things I need to graze. Can I have some land? And Abimelech said, fine. And who's the lady with you? Oh, that's my sister. Oh, his father had said the same thing when he went to Egypt years before. But somebody discovered that it wasn't his sister at all. It was his wife. And Abimelech says to him, what on earth are you trying to do? Are you trying to create problems for us? One of my men could have taken your wife and committed a great sin. This is the Gentile man, the ungodly man, recognising how evil the supposedly godly man has been. Now get out of my sight and off they go. And they ended up, end up in a place where Abraham had been years before and he dug some wells. And so Isaac started to re-dig the wells and finding the water that his father had found. And every time he dug a well and found the water, the Philistines came along and said, that's our water. Thank you very much. Thank you for undigging it. We'll have it. Now get out of here. And it happened several times until eventually Isaac found his way all the way back to Beersheba where the family had spent a lot of time. And in Beersheba he dug a well and it was a free flowing wonderful well. And he called it Rehoboth. The name means freedom. Where did he find it? He found it where he knew there was a reliable resource. He found it where he knew things would be okay. He found it where God had blessed his father before him. In our Salvation Army days, we would sing an old song that had the refrain, go back to the old wells where the waters are sweet. Go back to the old wells where joy and duty meet. The waters of the old wells will your spirit restore. Go back to the old wells and leave them no more. The old wells are like the gifting that's on your life. Don't go looking for some new thing. Don't go looking for a fresh touch. 
Oh, Pastor Neil, pray for me today. I need a fresh touch. Press into what God's already put on your life. Yes, let the man of God bless you. There is an anointing on the life that we need in this house. And if anything is troubling me about leaving this house is I need to find a man who I can trust to stand with. I trust this man. But it's not up to him to activate my gifting. It's up to me, as it were, to redig the old well, to keep the water flowing, to keep the water happening, to keep the, the refreshing coming. Peter says we've got to stir up our pure minds by way of remembrance of what God has said already. And Paul says to Timothy, stir up the gift of God that is on you. It came through anointing and through the prophetic word. People in this house, we've heard Neil get yet again a prophetic vision this morning for what God's about to do. If he's going to use you in the move of God, you better open up afresh to the gift that's on your life. Because God will have to bypass people who are not bothering because he'll, he'll just have to be conservative with, the, with what he needs to do to use those who are open to what he wants to do. And I want to put my hand up and say, I'm open to what he wants to do and I'm pressing in. Pastor Joe, come out please. Pastor David, come this morning. Pastor Neil and Nance, come. I want to make a point about these precious men. And there are others in the house, but I just want to make a point about these precious people. Why is it? I'm the young one in this mix, by the way. You need to know that. But I want to say to you, why is it that there is still a ministry that's alive in them? Why is it that we still appreciate the anointing that's on their life? Why is it that we seek to sit under their leadership and their guidance and their direction? Why is it that we are touched when they minister to us and, and, and pray for us and anoint us? Because they have continued to press into God. Now, I don't know David's story so much. I know a bit of the others but I think I know a little bit about David, enough to know that they, like Merle and I, have had setbacks along the way that could have brought it all to an end. But they treasured the anointing. They pressed into the gifting. They did their utmost to stir it up. And I don't know you, about you, but they are still pretty good stirrers, every one of them. The gifting is alive in them because they have chosen to stir it up. And I could add Tom and others here without any trouble at all. The gift is alive because you've stirred it up still. And why am I still preaching with the setbacks that Merle and I have had? Because I do honestly treasure the anointing. I'll never forget the night that I was ordained. And as we got back to the Bible college, the next day we were going to get our appointments to our first ministry assignment. It's the way the Salvation Army did it. And we knew that somebody was going to be appointed back to the Bible college as a lecturer. And one of my good friends said to me, Chris, I don't know what you're going to do. I haven't worked out where they're going to put you, but it won't be here. You've got such an awful personality. Well, thank you for the encouragement. The next day I stood on the Sydney Town Hall platform and the commissioner called my name and had Lieutenant Christopher Pack march forward and saluted and the commissioner said, I appoint you to the training college. I haven't had a lesson in teaching in one day in my life and suddenly I'm a teacher and a trainer. Why? 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 Because there was a night when we were having a, 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 a renewal type meeting in the Bible college. And people were coming forward and kneeling at the Salvation Army mercy seat and, and seeking God afresh. And I stood up in the prayer meeting and I said, I said, God, you have said if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? I am asking you and you are on a promise. And I fell forward to that mercy seat and wept my heart out. 
and the anointing to come. Who wants to say this morning, I'm going to start pressing in all over again? Because if you do, there's some men and women of God would happily stand with you and pray with you. Why don't we all stand? If you should be out here this morning, you come. You come. The final word in my notes is simply this. The biggest problem in the church, someone said many years ago, the greatest problem in the church is the unemployment problem. Anointed, gifted people doing absolutely zilch. Now I'm not suggesting you're doing zilch, but I am suggesting that there are many who could do with a fresh touch this morning who could mark this moment by saying to God, I am going to start pressing in all over again to let you do with my life what you have called me to do. I am pressing into God today. I am starting afresh the ministry of pressing in. I'm going to stir up the gift that is in me. I'm going to let you, God, do whatever you want. I just want you to use. If that's you, you come. You come. Come on, you come. Holy Spirit, come. Koi ta 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 ta. Right, just feel for me. Just bless the people as they come. We just want to stand in agreement with you. We we just want to tell you that that as you are saying to God in a new way this morning, I want to stir up what's in me, then we just want to stand with you and agree with you today. We agree with you. We want to let God stir you up and use you in a way you've never been used. I'm sure there are many more. I honestly am. I'm sure there are many more. Please don't be embarrassed. Please don't feel that there's any sense of of looking sideways to see who's here or anything like that. We just want to bless the fact that you are open to God today and you are saying in response to Paul's words to stir up the gift of God that was in you. You are saying, yes, Lord, yes, 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 yes. I want you to stir it up. I'm going to do everything I can to stir it up. I want to fulfill the calling and the anointing and the gifting that's on my life. And I want to do that in Jesus' name. As we sing, as we worship, you come. And our ministry team and other members of the leadership team, if you want to come and share in the ministry, or if you want to come and stand on the prayer line, either way, just get involved this morning. With grace and peace Your mercy Surprises me It heals my heart It helps me see